The English Language, Its Origins and Evolution. When we look at the evolution of English through the ages, generally three stages are recognized. First, Old English from the 9th century or earlier until the 12th century. Then Middle English, roughly between the 12th and 15th centuries. And then Modern English from the 16th century onwards. This is a rough subdivision. No strict lines can be drawn between these stages and linguists disagree about the start and end of each period. Let's first have a look at how the language started out. Within Saxon England, a language began to develop from the group of Ingvionic dialects, a group also known as North Sea Germanic. It was a group that included, among others, Old Frisian and Old Saxon. At first, this language was purely Germanic. There was hardly any influence from the Celts who had been driven out. Influence from Latin, however, did start pretty early, from what remained of Roman influence, and more importantly, through religion. Christianity had arrived in England as early as the end of the 6th century. Anyway, that developing language, which we now call Old English, is hard to recognize as English for us but it was the basis of what eventually developed into our contemporary English. The first texts in the Roman alphabet date from about 700 AD. We tend to speak of Old English at least from the late 9th century onwards, but some linguists put it much further back, even to the start of the settlement of the Angles and Saxons at the end of the 5th century. Among the sources of Old English, we should mention at least Cadman's hymn, written sometime between 660 and 680 AD, and generally recognized as the oldest source of Old English. Beowulf, an epic poem dating back to around 1000 AD. The Ecclesiastical History, written by Bede, a monk often referred to as the Venerable Bede, and the so-called Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, basically records of events kept in a number of monasteries around the country. We can also still recognize Old English or Saxon elements, especially suffixes, in place names. Place names ending in ing, meaning the people of, we can see, for instance, in Reading, Hastings, Dorking. Place names ending in Tun, meaning village or enclosure, as in Taunton, Luton, Brighton, Nuneaton, and also uh, the suffix Ham, meaning farm, home, settlement, for instance in Dagenham, Twickenham, or Birmingham. Yes, even though it's now amongst the biggest cities in Britain, Birmingham certainly seems to have had humble beginnings. When we look at vocabulary, Old English is certainly still important in present day English. Looking at the 100 most frequently used words in contemporary English, 96 come straight from Old English. For instance, we have a number of prepositions such as with, on, in, to, into, by, some articles or pronouns, the, a, uh, you, he, I, me, that, which, some verbs or verb forms such as is, was, are, have, can, and so on. A few ordinary nouns, word, time, people, water, part, day, oil, and also words like not, as, or, and, so, no, if, one, and two. Let's have a look at a short text fragment in Old English. 
See if you recognize this. Feder ure, thu the ert on hevonum. Se the nama jehalgod. Tobe cume thin riche. Ye werde thin villa on erdan swa swa on hevonum. If we replace this with the modern English version from the 17th century, we get our Father who art in heaven, and so on. What you see in the old English text is partly recognizable, but many elements, and also the pronunciation, probably remind you more of German or Dutch than of English. Look at words like Jehalgod, and compare that to German or Dutch geheiligt, geheiligt, or the word gewerde, Dutch geworden, or in the second line see, very similar to the Dutch zij. In order to give you a really good idea as to what Old English probably sounded like, listen to this recording of an extract from the epic poem Beowulf. Thou wast mad my fella of fair wagum frat wa ye laded. The hirde itch kumli kor chel ye yer one hilde wapnum and hal the wadum billum and birnum. He mon bear me lag mad my manigo tha him mid shouldon on floatis acht fair ye weetan. You would never think this was a form of English, would you? In 1066, the Normans conquered England and they brought French with them. Within a very short time, French became the language of the court and more importantly also of all important institutions, swamping Old English with French vocabulary. French basically became the official language, pushing Old English into the background. Let's look at just a few examples in some important fields. Concerning military matters, you have, for instance, army, archer, soldier, guard. To do with hierarchy, crown, court, duke, nobility, peasant, servant, govern, authority, obedience. In the matters of law, arrest, justice, judge, jury, sentence, prison. And concerning cookery, salmon, oyster, pork, fruit, lemon, biscuit, sugar, cream, herb, and appetite. All those, to our ears, perfectly English words all came straight from French. Written English especially came under threat as French was used by the upper educated classes and Latin was generally used as a language for written records. The Anglo-Saxon chronicles gradually died out. Records switched to Latin, with very few exceptions. The last entry in English was found in the Peterborough Monastery in 1154. However, Old English did live on but at first only in the lower classes and in spoken form. For instance, in words like cow, sheep, pig, calf, ox, deer. Note that those Old English words refer to the animals as kept and killed by ordinary people, whereas the French vocabulary used by the higher classes refers to the meat, beef, mutton, pork, veal, venison. It is a perfect example of the start of the extraordinary wealth of the English language, adopting vocabulary from both Germanic and Romance origins. In the development of English, we have come to the second stage, Middle English, usually situated between the 12th and 15th centuries. The Norman dynasty had come and gone, but the Plantagenets were still Francophone, and as such, the influence of French on English continued. Yet, things were changing, 
and English was getting stronger and more influential again. In the 14th century, William of Nassington wrote in English about who spoke which language. He wrote, I believe that no one can speak Latin except those who have taken it at school. And some who are accustomed to the court and live there know French and know Latin. And some whose grasp of French is shaky know a bit of Latin. And some understand English well who know neither Latin nor French. But educated and uneducated, old and young, they all understand the English tongue. So also the aristocracy was moving away from French and adopting English. At the end of the 14th century, Richard II was the first king since King Harold to use English again. Under his rule, English replaced French in schools, in courts of law and in parliament. English had survived the French domination and emerged stronger than ever. As an example of Middle English, we can have a look at Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. I can let you listen to part of the introduction to the work. Please pay attention to the pronunciation. One that April, with his surest sorta, the draught of March, hath pierced to the rota, and bathed every vein in switch liqueur, of which vertu engendered is the floor. One zephyrus egg with his sweet a breath, in spirit hath in every halt and hath, tender cropus, and the young suna hath in the ram is alva corsirona, and smale fullus mac and melodia, that slep in all the nicht with open ear, so pricketh him natur in her courages, than long in fall to go on pilgrimages, and palmeres for to seek in strangest strondes, to fair nehalwes, couth in sundry londes. When you simply look at the text, you will be able to recognize it as a form of English even though it's definitely not the English that we know. Yet, listening to it, you are hard put to immediately classify it as English. By the time the Canterbury Tales were written, spelling was beginning to be fixed, and relatively little has changed since then. But, as far as pronunciation is concerned, great changes have taken place since the end of the 14th century. Putting the two next to each other, you may now recognize where some of the strange spelling in English comes from. Think, for instance, of night, about two thirds into the text. If you hear it pronounced as nicht, you suddenly see that the spelling makes sense. It's just that the spelling has remained, whereas the pronunciation has changed dramatically. We have come to the third and final stage in the development of the English language, namely modern English. Generally, the term is used for the English used from the 16th century onwards. During the period of the Renaissance, many new ideas spread across Europe with new vocabulary to match. English, from its beginning, had always been a language that was very open to new vocabulary from other languages. Just think of Old English and how many French words it had incorporated. One particular man, William Shakespeare, probably had the greatest single influence on the language, contributing hundreds of words and expressions. Just a few examples here, a couple of words, lacklustre, dwindle, sea change, bandit, swagger, laughingstock, and then also quite a few expressions. One fell swoop, good riddance, it's all Greek to me, what's done is done, brave new world, and so many others. Under Elizabeth I, a period of discoveries began, both geographically and otherwise, and those discoveries had their influence on the language. New products, contacts with new languages and new cultures also meant new vocabulary. 
One book needs to be mentioned in particular in connection with modern English, namely the so-called King James Bible, published in 1611, the first official translation of the Bible into English. To this day, it is still considered important and a beautiful and influential work of literary value. By the end of the 17th century, the so-called Great Vowel Shift, involving a change in pronunciation of most long vowels and diphthongs, had been completed, and modern English had evolved to be quite close to present-day English. We will conclude by looking at a few more examples of how English has enriched its vocabulary by borrowing words from other languages. As I said before, the Renaissance and the Age of Discoveries, followed by the expansion of the Empire, opened up many opportunities for the languages to embrace loan words. These are just a few examples. From Spanish and Portuguese, English borrowed embargo, apricot, tornado, banana, mosquito, tobacco. From Italian, we got opera, violin, cameo, volcano. From Dutch, English borrowed smuggle, landscape, keelhole, knapsack, yacht. From Arabic, we got alcohol, harem, sheik. From Malay, we got bamboo and amok. From Turkish, words such as coffee and kiosk. From Persian, we got assassin, checkmate, bazaar and jackal. And we could give many more examples. English, obviously, has not stopped evolving. Like any living language, it changes every day. And in the future, linguists may well recognize further stages in its development.